a lot of information I want to share today as we wrap up um, October. Can you believe that October is coming to a close? Um, we're headed down the home stretch of 2020. And uh, as we close out October, I hope, you know, you've gotten into some better spiritual shape, no matter where you were at the beginning of the month. Um, the goal is let's finish the month strong. Let's finish the year strong. Uh, I know 2020 has been a really strange year for all of us in, in all kinds of different ways. But I think even in the, the strange year, uh, we can still be strengthened in the Lord. And, um, and so my prayer is that during this month, you'll get in the best spiritual shape of your life so you can head into the last part of this year, moving toward the victory that God has for you. And, and so we've, of course, been studying um, the prayer of Jabez. Uh, in First Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 9 and 10. And so the last Wednesday installment of that is what we're going to cover today and uh, how to deal with and overcome temptation is what we're going to do principally. And then I want to leave just some time for us to discuss as we normally do anything with today's lesson or any of the lessons we've been teaching over the last month. So let me pray for you, and then we'll go ahead and jump right in to our, our study together. Father, in Jesus' name, I love you. We love you. We honor you and bless you and praise you. You are so wonderful, and you are worthy of our praise. God, thank you for what you did, <clears throat> even on this past Sunday, where you got all the glory. You brought us together in fellowship and praise and worship and preaching, and just great to see our brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for that, and we now ask you to breathe upon this Zoom call, to breathe upon this Bible study, that again, we might hear your voice through your word, that we again might walk in your uh, will, and that we might um, be uh, a blessing to those that we come in contact with as a result of being in your presence today. Now, Lord God, I pray for your people, and I pray for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Again, if you don't have the outline, just uh, chat with Demika. Um, she can get you the outline that I've been sharing uh, on um, the prayer of Jabez. It's been a four-week study, so we're coming here to the uh, the last the last week, the last installment. And um, what we want to do is talk about how we deal with temptation, how we overcome temptation. Um, so here's a couple things that we're going to learn today. Uh, one is what does it mean uh, to be kept uh, from the evil one? Uh, when Jabez, Jabez prayed, he prayed, of course, that God would bless him indeed, that God would um, right expand his territory, that God would uh, keep his hand of protection upon him, meaning the presence of God would be with him. But he also prayed that God would keep him from the evil one and keep him from causing pain. So we're going to find out exactly what that means to be kept from uh, evil, and then why we should pray about that, why that should be something significant to us. We're going to also talk about the different facets of evil that comes. In part, we're going to talk about um, temptation and where temptation comes from, and then uh, we're going to talk about the resources that God gives to us um, in order to overcome those temptations and how you can escape temptation. So those are the things we're going to learn and deal with today. Now, as I've pastored and I've talked to different people, um, here's, here's a couple of um, uh, attitudes that people have toward uh, sin, people have toward um, uh, temptation and the devil. And about four or five of them, I want to give them to you up front, and you can decide whether or not you fit in one or two or three or all of these categories, or maybe you don't fit in any of these categories, but I call them snake-eyed thoughts and toxic fumes, meaning uh, if we have the wrong view of the enemy, if we have the wrong view of the devil, then uh, sometimes we can get ourselves in trouble. And so, um, hang on a second, let me do this real quick. Okay. All right. We can get ourselves in trouble. Some people think like this. You, you can tell me if you know some people, maybe this has been you or maybe this is you. I am auto insured. In other words, uh, I think if I live right as a Christian, I'm automatically covered, that if I just read my Bible and, and pray and go to church and support ministry, that I don't have to worry about the devil. I don't have to worry about enemy creeping into my life. And so some people think they are auto-insured, that it's, they're automatically covered. 
other people think um, that they're underpowered and overwhelmed, meaning um, they are in a season of intense temptation and they can't handle them or they feel like their temptation is overpowering them. They just feel overpowered or underpowered and overwhelmed. They just feel like temptation is taking over their life. Uh, some people are uh, what I like to call a temptation junkie. <laughs> Why flee temptation? They like living close to the edge. Um, I know some friends of mine, and there was a time in my life, I like living close to the edge. Um, you know, it's, it's more exciting when you live life on the edge sometimes, people think. And so a temptation junkie is a person who puts themselves in compromising positions all the time because they just like the adrenaline rush. They like the excitement that comes from living life on the edge. And that's a dangerous place to, to be when you're dealing with the devil. Uh, a couple more. Uh, some people think um, they just don't believe that the devil exists. They're what we call devil doubters. They don't believe in the devil and they don't believe in spiritual opposition. They think we are being spooky when we talk about um, the devil. And so some people are devil doubters. Somebody else might um, just choose uh, to lose. Uh, in other words, they think that sin is normal. Um, they think it's meant to be. These are people who will say things like this. Well, everybody's doing it. Uh, well, you know, Pastor, that, that's what life is like now. That's the times in which we live. You know, what's wrong with it? You know, don't be so antiquated and outdated. And these are people who just uh, uh, look at it and they've adopted a mindset of just choosing to lose. They just, if, if the rest of the world is sinning, the rest of the world is committing adultery or fornication or lying or whatever, they just assume that's just how our society is. I'm not the worst person in society, so I just, I just go with the flow. And then uh, some people have the attitude, I'm home alone. They don't trust God to help them and they don't feel worthy of the help that God wants to supply them. So they just try to go it alone. They, they try to deal with the enemy's temptations and the enemy's um, uh, attacks in, in, in their own power, in their own way. So um, those are some attitudes that people have. You may be, uh, you may fall in one or two or three of those. And by the end of the Bible study today, I'm hopefully gonna give you some things that no matter what, uh, where you fall in that, um, a realm or in that sequence of, of attitudes that you'll have some real life things that you can do to defeat and to, to resist the enemy when he comes in. So one of the first things that we want to look at then is what is temptation and how does it work? What is temptation and how does it work? Uh, here's, a, here's a real simple definition. Temptation is the pull we feel to please ourselves at the expense of pleasing God. Temptation is that inner pull that we feel to please ourselves at the expense of pleasing God. There are times when we just want to do it our way. Um, it's like that old commercial on um, Burger King used to have, uh, have it your way, have it your own way. Special orders don't upset us. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. You just uh, want to order life up the way you want it. And sometimes we, we tend to do that at the expense of what would be pleasing unto God. And so sometimes our desires, our will is contrary and in conflict with what God's will is for our life. And when you think about temptation and how it works, uh, when you read John, 1 John chapter uh, number two and verse 15 and 16. In fact, let me, let me go there because there's three different fronts that we have to end up fighting um, the devil on. There's three different fronts found in 1 John uh, chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16. Here's what it says. 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here it is. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so when we are trying to deal with um, the, the, the devil and we deal with temptation, it's, it's really a three front war. There's the war that we have to deal with in the world, meaning just the world that we live in. It's a fallen world. And no matter where you go, you can go to Indianapolis, Chicago, you can go to Miami, you can go to 
uh, Los Angeles, you can go, go to Rome, you can go to Ontario, Canada, you can go to Cancun, Mexico, wherever you go in this world, you won't escape um, the fallen nature in this world. So that that's just one front. The other front is no matter where you go in this world, you and I always take ourselves wherever we go. <laughs> so whatever is tempting to you here in Indianapolis is going to be tempting to you in Las Vegas, it's going to be tempting to you in New York. So we uh, live in these bodies. We live in the flesh. And so that's another uh, uh, front. That's another battleground that we have to deal with, not only the world, but the flesh. And then in this world, there's an enemy that's called the devil, uh, Satan, the tempter, the accuser of the brethren. And so we have to fight this fight on three different three different levels. The world, that's, that's the outside. Um, the flesh, that's what's in this world. And the devil who is opposing us. So it's a three front war. And so uh, here's how temptation works. When, when we look at this on this three front war, um, the world refers to non-Christian values, non-Christian values that are promoted by secular or pagan belief systems. That's what the world is. It's non-Christian values that are promoted by secular or pagan um, belief systems. And there are three elements of the world that really tempt us. I just read to you 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16. And those three elements, when we uh, look at it, are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That when we look at each one of these, uh, when you deal with the world, when we try to interact in the world, in our bodies, three things are gonna come up with us. It doesn't matter our age, it doesn't matter our color, it doesn't matter what background we came from. We all are susceptible to these three things. He says, it's the lust of the flesh, it's what my flesh desires. It's the lust of the eyes, what my eyes see. And it's the pride of life. It's, it's, it's something in me that, that wants to think more highly of myself than I should. It's something in you that doesn't want to see yourself the way God sees you, but sees yourself in an inflated view or a distorted view. And so those three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are elements um, that are in the world that we have to deal with, okay? And so we can all um, talk to people. We've all been in situations and circumstances where those things are at play. What I desire in my flesh, what I see with my eyes and what my attitude is uh, toward the world. And so that's how the world works. Um, now let's look at the flesh. What is temptation? How does it work as it relates to the flesh? Let me read to you um, Galatians chapter five and verse 16 through 21, Galatians chapter five and verse 16 through 21, helps us to understand how the flesh works uh, in this world that we live in. Galatians chapter five, verse 16 through 21, here's what it says. It says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not uh, the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident and he lists those which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I've told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So the flesh refers to the term for sinful appetites that originate in our sinful nature and our sinful desires, our physical desires. And so when we think about why do we see so much evil in the world? Why do we see people operating in a certain way? Why do we see people doing certain things? Shoot, why do we see ourselves doing certain things? Why do we, why do we practice certain things? Uh, and, and Galatians lists out some of the things that happens when we don't walk by the Spirit or we're not led by the Spirit. 
but we end up being led by our flesh. All kinds of evilness begins to show up. Fornication, adultery, lewdness, drunkenness, dissensions, uh, outbursts of wrath. You wonder why people do certain things uh, in a fit of rage, in a fit of anger. It's born out of a fleshly desire to have things their way. Um, people are um, high-minded, all kinds of the, everything that's in that list. And there's more that was, that was not mentioned in that list there in Galatians. Those things happen because, again, we live in a world that is a fallen world, but we have some desires within us that are not of God. And when we don't get those under the control of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit, then all kinds of evil can break out as a result of the desires of our flesh. And I know if you are honest and I'm honest, there's been some seasons in my life, some situations in my life, I'm not proud of them, where I've given over to the desires of the flesh and, and the result has been uh, not a good and pretty picture. Uh, when I'm not led by the spirit, my flesh can take over and it's just not a good, it's just not a good look. So that's, that's the flesh. And then let's talk about the devil, because again, we got to fight the world out, fight the, the, the flesh within, and then we have to fight the devil, uh, who is our opposition, okay? And so when we look at the devil, I know a lot of times people don't believe uh, that the devil exists, but the devil is real. And one of, the, one of the greatest lies that the devil tells people is that he doesn't exist, because if the devil in a person's mindset or in their theology or their thinking doesn't exist, then they are easy prey for the devil to come in and wreak havoc in their life. And so that's why the word of God tells us the truth about everything. God it tells us the truth about Jesus. The Holy Spirit tells us the truth about ourselves. But the word of God also tells us the truth about our opposition, that the devil is in fact real. Not something we need to be afraid of, but it's Definitely, he is something we, we need to be aware of. And so 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8 helps us to understand a description of what God's word says about our common enemy and our common foe. Let's go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 in verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, here's what it says. It tells us to be sober, be vigilant, Vigilant, I'm sorry, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Again, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Did you hear how God describes the devil to us? He calls him first an adversary. He says he's an adversary, and he says he's the devil. And then he further describes him as a roaring lion who's walking about seeking whom he may devour. And so the devil is the tempter and he fiercely opposes God's will and God's work in our life. The devil is an enemy of God. And when you and I are children of God, when we commit ourselves to Christ, we've put ourselves in the crosshairs of the enemy of God, which is the devil. And, and God describes him as a roaring lion. And so this roaring lion description helps us to understand how we ought to deal with and how we ought to handle um, this, this enemy, our common enemy, Satan or the devil. He says he's a roaring lion. Do you know how a lion stalks his prey uh, in the jungle, how he stalks his prey uh, in, in the safari? He, he does it strategically. A lion is a strategic hunter. Uh, he doesn't just go off and just, just hunt haphazardly. No, a lion is very strategic. He will spend, or a lioness will spend uh, uh, hours stalking their prey, just kind of following them around the jungle or following them around um, a particular portion of land and stalking them, watching them, just like the enemy does with you and me. He doesn't always pounce on you right away. He stalks you. He stalks me to see what we like, to see what we don't like, to see what our tendencies are, to see what our habits are, to see what our desires are. And as he's walking around, you may not notice him because he's like a lion that's that's undercover, um, that's in the bushes, hiding and laying in wait 
for the right opportunity to pounce, for the right opportunity to take advantage because he's he's strategic and he's a stalker. He follows us around. Again, we may not know it, but the devil is present with us. Now, he's not, I'm not present. He can't be everywhere at the same time. He's not like God, but he does have other angels that are fallen that stalk us and follow us around and see where we are and see if he can't create opportunities for us to fall into traps. And then lastly, the way a, a, a lion hunts is he hunts by scare tactics or fear. Remember, the enemy is called a roaring lion uh, who is trying to devour us. And when that lion or lioness roars, one of the things they do is they paralyze the, 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 the animal that they're stalking so that, that animal freezes in fear and then now they're prey for the devil. What the devil wants to do is to scare us. God tells us not to, to be afraid. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But we ought to respectfully understand what the enemy is trying to do in our life. And so sometimes when the devil is ready to pounce on you, he'll do it in a way that sets up a trap and that puts you in a situation where now it appears as if you have no way to escape. But God always gives us a way to escape. Okay, so let's look at a couple of things. So that's that's what we're fighting against the world. We're having to deal with the flesh and we're having to deal with the devil. So let's look at a couple of examples uh, about how to avoid temptation, because the Bible not only tells us what we're up against, but gives us some good examples about how to avoid temptation. And one of the best examples is found in Genesis 39. In your private time, read Genesis 39. We don't have time to read it here, but I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it for you. It's the story of Joseph. Uh, remember, Joseph was um, uh, sold into slavery by his brothers because they were jealous of him. And when they, they sell him into slavery, Joseph finds himself in Egypt, and he's been sold into slavery, and he's in Egypt, and he's serving a man named Potiphar. Potiphar uh, was an Egyptian official. He had a house. He had other servants. He had possessions, and he had a wife, and Joseph became uh, one of his chief servants in his house because Potiphar understood that Joseph had the Lord with him. And whatever Joseph touched, whatever Joseph did, God blessed it, even in Egypt, even when he was a, a servant in Potiphar's house. And one day, Potiphar's wife begins to lust after Joseph. She liked the way he looked. She liked the way he worked. And she began to lust after him. And she then was used by the enemy to try to tempt Joseph into sleeping with her and ruining his reputation, ruining his position with Potiphar and ruining what God wanted to do uh, in his life. And so when you read that, that story, there's some steps that Joseph takes that we can use in our own lives when temptation comes our way. And when you read that story in, in, in chapter 39 of Genesis, we discover that first of all, Potiphar's wife began to talk to Joseph and she tried to convince him through conversation to have an affair with him or her. And, and then after that didn't work, she, she waited for an opportunity um, to have all of the servants leave the house. The only person who was in the house was Joseph. And she tried to throw herself on Joseph and have Joseph to have an affair. And Joseph uh, refused that and rejected that advance. And then finally, when it was, when it was, too tough and it was just too hot in the kitchen if you will joseph just she grabbed his clothes and tried to take his clothes off joseph ran out of the house uh and left her holding his his garments and he just ran away um from the woman didn't commit uh the adultery stayed true to god stayed true to his his oath to potiphar not to touch his wife and so when we find ourselves in temptation we can learn three things from joseph number one the first thing is just to flat out reject an offer to do something we know is not godly. Just flat out reject it. Don't argue with it. Don't debate it. Don't dialogue. Just flat out reject it. They offer you an opportunity to do something that's wrong. not right. No, I don't want to do it. And then if somebody keeps coming to you with conversation about something that's not godly or not right, don't listen to the conversation. Um, even if you're in a situation where you're a captivated, captive audience, um, you don't have to, to give way to what they're saying. Um, you can respectfully listen, but don't let it become a part of your thinking. 
And then when it's all said and done, if there's no other way out, just exit the situation. Just just leave. Just just don't stay in that situation longer than you need to be. Those are some ways that Joseph teaches us how we can avoid um, temptation. So read Genesis chapter 39, and, and it's a very, very powerful picture about the temptation that comes, but that God always gives us a way to avoid that temptation, okay? So um, you can also read the story of Judges chapter 16 um, with Samson and talked about um, the consequences of when we uh, don't um, heed God's warnings against temptation. So here's the question. How do I win against temptation? How do I win against temptation? And one of the best scriptures to help us to do that is uh, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I want you to write that down. Get that memorized uh, in your in your spirit uh, because that is going to be something that you can always uh, be reminded of whenever you find yourself in a tempting situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 says, no temptation has seized you or overtaken you except such as is common to man. Here it is. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay. When, whenever you and I get tempted, understand this and know this, is that we are never tempted by anything that is new. There's nothing new under the sun. It may be dressed up differently. It may smell differently. It may look differently. But it all comes back to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. There's no temptation that has seized you or overtaken you except that which is common to man. And that means it's common to people in the culture we live in. It's common to people outside the culture we live in. It's common to people in the times in which we live. But it's also common to people that lived well before us. That's why we can read what's in the scripture and know that just like Joseph faced temptation in his day, we're going to face temptation in our day. Our children are going to face temptation. No matter where we go or who or where we live, we are going to face the temptation. It's common to man, but God says that when we are tempted, we won't be tempted beyond what we can bear, right? The temptation doesn't come from God. Her, uh, James chapter 1, 13 and 15 helps us to understand it doesn't come from God, but it comes from us being drawn away and enticed by our own desires. When the devil brings a temptation to you and the devil brings a temptation to me, he doesn't bring us what we don't like. That's why you're not tempted by what I'm tempted by. And I'm not tempted by what you're tempted by. Uh, somebody may put a caramel apple in front of you and you, you don't have any temptation because you don't like caramel apples. But if you put a caramel apple in front of me, boy, you better come get it because I'm going to bite into it uh, real fast because I love caramel and I love apples. And you put two of those together, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm gonna, it's going to be hard for me to resist that caramel apple. That's what I like. You may not like that. So that was not going to give you something you don't like. We are tempted when we are drawn away and enticed of our own desires, what we desire. That's how temptation works. And so when I understand how it works, then I can understand how to avoid it. Let's look at James chapter one, verse 13 through 15. Because I want to show you uh, the, the progression, the steps of progression of how sin works in our lives. Uh, James, I said James chapter 1 and verse 13. Uh, I want to show you how um, this progression works. James, Peter, John. James chapter 1 and uh, verse 13 through 15. Uh, let me read this to you. Here's what it says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So there it is. God is not the source of the temptation, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So there's a five step um, process, if you will, when we're trying to deal with with sin. Now, let me say this. God does not tempt us, right? We're tempted when we're drawn away 
of our own desires. So that's the first thing that happens with temptation. It draws us away by our own desire. But the second thing is we are enticed. We're drawn away uh, by our own desires. And then secondly, we are enticed. That doesn't mean that temptation itself is the sin because all of us are tempted. Um, Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet he was without sin. So the temptation itself is not the sin. The sin is when we give in to the temptation. And when we do that, the third step is uh, there's a conception that takes place. Sin, uh, when we sin, it's like giving birth to something. And when we give birth to that sin, initially, when a woman conceives a child, um, you don't see any consequences of the conception. She's pregnant. Um, you, 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 things don't look any different, though there's something different going on on the inside of her. Initially, nobody can tell. Um, she may not even know, but, but there's something growing inside of her at conception. That's what sin is like. That's why sometimes we feel like we got away with sin. We do something and a uh, pastor and the preacher and the teacher has been telling us, don't do it, don't do it. We do it. And, and we think, oh my God, I got away with it. No, because when that sin happens, it conceives. And then the next step is it grows. And when that sin grows, then the next step is it produces death, right? So we may not see the consequences of sinful behavior, sinful actions and attitudes and activity right away, but we can rest assured, according to James, that there's a process that takes place. We are, we're drawn away of our own desires. We're enticed. When we sin, sin conceives. Something is born in us. That, that sin grows and that sin leads to death. And that death is a separation from God and a separation and it breaks the fellowship that we have with God when we sin because it grieves the Holy Spirit, it violates God's word, it causes so many other consequences. So that's the progression of how the devil wants us to fall when we fall into sin and into temptation. And so, um, you know, there's, there's three things that you can do according to James chapter four uh, and Ephesians chapter six and 10 uh, through 20. The first thing to avoid or defeat temptation is submit to the Lord. James 4 and 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. It says, submit to God, James 4 and 7, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Now, a lot of people will try to just resist the devil. And you can resist for a while, but unless there's some submission to God, the enemy's not going to give up. So the first thing that, that James tells us to do is submit our life to God. Each and every day you get up, submit to God. During the, during the day, recommit and resubmit your life and your desires to God. When you submit to God now, when the enemy comes, you can resist him. And when the enemy realizes that you've submitted to God and are resisting him, after a while, he's going to give up. And he's going to resist. He's going to resist you for a while, but then he's going to flee from you. So the first two things you can do is submit to God, resist the devil. The third thing in Ephesians chapter six is put on the whole armor of God so that you don't have to, um, you're fighting against the devil, but you're fighting with the armor of God on, you're not fighting it in your flesh because we know the flesh uh, is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why we have to cover this flesh in the armor of God. So submit, resist, and then put on the armor of God. That's how you defeat, defeat the enemy uh, in the flesh, okay? Um, and, and so let me drop down here to giving you some, some scriptures that you can use to overcome some attitudes about um, the enemy. Um, the first thing is, if you feel like you're a person who is just auto-insured, that you don't have to worry about um, this whole idea of being tempted, I want you to understand um, there's, a, there's a scripture that can help you to uh, think a little bit differently about that attitude, and that is in uh, Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one helps us to understand that if a person sins, Galatians chapter six, verse one, I'm sorry, Galatians six and one, if a person sins, we who are spiritual need to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted and fall into sin. So all of us uh, are susceptible to sin. So we don't need to be pointing the finger at other people saying, ha ha, look at them. We need to recognize that all of us, um, 
can fall into sin if we're not careful and if we're not sensitive to what God is doing in our life, okay? Number two, if you are a person who feels underpowered and overwhelmed, go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 or chapter 10, verse 13. If you feel underpowered and overwhelmed, remember God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear and he will provide a way of escape. When it gets intense, God will provide a way of escape. You just like Joseph have to take that way when it's provided to you. If you are a temptation junkie, meaning like you just can't get enough of temptation, if you just like living life on the edge, Proverbs 6 and 27 and 28 helps us to understand that you don't want to play around with fire because a person who plays around with fire is going to what? Eventually get burned. In other words, you can't walk across hot coals and not get burned. You can't take fire into your into your mouth and into your body and have it not burn you. So if you're one of those persons that likes to live on the wild side, likes to live on the edge, um, Proverbs 6 and 27 through 28 tells us, be careful because you can and will get burned uh, in this life. And if you doubt that the devil is real, just again, read. First Peter chapter five and eight and understand that the devil is like a roaring lion uh, who's seeking whom he may devour. Read the story of Job and you'll re recognize that the enemy goes back and forth in the world seeking whom he may, he may take out. And God sometimes will point him in your direction just to show you and to show the enemy that you have the faith to be able to come overcome him. So there are going to be seasons and times when you come face to face with the devil because he is real, but God is stronger and you are stronger with God than the devil is in your life. And if you're one of these people who just kind of gives up and it's like, you know what, I don't have um, what it takes to be able to, to defeat the devil. The Bible says you do. You and I have a choice. We can make a choice right now today to say, I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to live in my flesh. I'm going to live according to the spirit. I'm going to be led by the spirit according to Romans chapter six, and I'm not going to give in to the devil. And then the last thing is, you don't have to fight this on your own. We have help in God. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and 9, God will supply the help that we need. All right? So those are some things that I wanted to share with you to help you understand what is temptation? Where does it come from? Where does the devil, um, how does the devil get into our situations? How do we avoid it? Or how do we overcome the temptation? The temptation itself is not sin. The temptation doesn't come from God. But the temptation is real and the temptation is true for all of us. And, and we have some ways and some strategies to avoid it. And we can do that. And that's what Jabez was praying. He said, keep me from evil. And what God does is he, he will do that by giving us these principles that he's given us today. to Keep us from evil and to fall into the traps of the enemy. Okay. All right. Well, I want to give enough time today. We got a good 15 minutes so we in good time. I want to give enough time for any questions, because I know I covered a lot of ground today, and I love I covered a lot of ground this this whole month, but I wanted to give y'all opportunity to ask me any questions about the, the, the lesson today or anything about the prayer, Jabez, that we've studied over the last um, three to four weeks, okay? So we'll open it up for any questions. If you want to do that, just click on your unmute button and uh, fire away. Anybody? Any comments? Any questions? Nope. Y'all all good? Y'all got all of that? I think the silence is we got it all. We're processing it all. And it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. The Lord is doing a work in me right now. And I'm going to go put that cheesecake back in the refrigerator. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Yes. 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 Moderation. Moderation, Demeka. Moderation. That's the key. Moderation. Um, Pastor, yeah. when you were talking about Joseph, you gave us uh, three things to reject the offer, 
and the leave. I didn't get the one in the middle. Oh, uh, to refuse, to refuse, refuse to listen to it. Reject, refuse, and leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, when you read it, Mother, what Joseph was up against is it just wasn't a one-time thing with Potiphar's wife. Uh, she, she came to him the first time and she asked him to sleep with her and he rejected it. Then over time, she just kept communicating with him. She just kept talking to him. I'm sure she was probably saying things like, he won't find out or, you know, nobody will know. And the Bible says Joseph didn't heed her conversation. He didn't internalize it and begin to follow it. So he, re he rejected her offer at first. Then he refused to listen to what she was saying or heed it. And then lastly, he finally just ran away. He just ran away. And, and that middle one, I'm glad you brought that up, Mother. That middle one is so important because we all are pretty good, especially if we've been Christians for a while, just rejecting. I'm not doing that. It's the middle one <laughs> when they keep talking to us and sending text messages or uh, sending advertisements our way. You know, it doesn't always have to be fornication. It could be uh, we own the YouTube or Internet or whatever, and we just keep seeing ads, ads, ads. And the next thing we know, we didn't order something. We ain't got no business ordering uh, to feel the lust of the flesh. <laughs> and so... Um, just can refuse the offer. Just refuse to let it get in your spirit so that it becomes something you desire. And Pastor, I know a while back, uh, I mean, maybe a couple of years ago, and I had talked with you about a temptation I was confronted with, and you gave me that scripture in 1 Corinthians, and I I refer to it any not every time I'm you know but it always comes to mind especially about how he gives us a way to escape and that you know just always rings true every time I think or temptation comes my way and you emphasize that in our conversation a few times <laughs> And, you know, and I, when we were just going over that, I just always remember that scripture about him providing a way of escape. And it has helped me in many situations. Yep. And, and that's good, April. I'm, I'm glad that that's been helpful to you. And, and in my own life, what I have found is that God didn't always give us multiple ways of escape. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he'll give us a way out, you know, and if we don't take that way out, when we look back on it, we wish we had taken that way out, right? And, and so what we have to discipline ourselves to do is, again, no, the temptation is not the sin. The temptation just is proof positive that you're a real person, that, you, that you're a real live human being. So temptation is common to all of us. But we have to discipline ourselves that, God, I know I'm being tempted. Where is my escape? You know, where is my way out of this? And when I see it, I have to take it. Um, whether it's in the way I'm thinking, whether it's in the way I'm behaving, whether it's in the way I'm speaking, God will give me a way of escape. And I have to be sensitive enough to find that way out and then, and then move on. And as young people say, keep it moving and don't go back to it. Um, that that that's the issue. I mean, it, it's been so crazy. I remember sometimes when we would we would I call the fast for the church, and we would be fasting. And usually in those first couple of days, it was the hardest for me. After I get past the first couple of days, I'm good. I remember sometimes I circled around McDonald's like two times. <laughs> I would drive drive around McDonald's. Ah, oh, no, no, can't break the fast. And then I find myself going back around again. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> Go home and get you a salad and quit tripping, boy. <laughs> and so, uh, God would give me a way of escape. I know that sounds silly. Y'all probably don't do that. But I have driven around McDonald's knowing I don't need to eat that. Uh, and, and just realizing that's just how strong the temptation is. But God will give you a way of escape. And uh, once I started to find those outs, it became easier and easier uh, each and every time I resisted the devil after submitting to God. Who else? I was thinking about that fasting, Pastor. You know, sometimes we think we're stronger than we really, we really are because we say we're going to fast and 
we make up our mind for how long we're going to do it and and what we're giving up. And sometimes that what we say we're going to give up is still in the house, you know. And you're going <laughs> to say, "Oh, I can I can handle it. I'm 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 going to, you know, I'm I see it there, but I'm not going to do this, you know." And before it's over, what you've broken off, <laughs> stuck it in your mouth, and there goes your fast. <laughs> Yeah, somebody brought uh, somebody what blessed us this Sunday and brought some cupcakes, um, and they they brought them from this nice bakery and they they put them in my office. And when I came back after the worship, and um, they they said these pastor these are for you and Lady Camille and these are for the kids. And I I told my kids I said y'all better eat these because when when we get home I ain't no telling what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so I don't know if I got self control. I know I know I got your name on it, but it's every person for themselves once they get in this house. Because <laughs> I knew uh, I wasn't fasting, but I knew I, it wasn't on my diet. I told Camille I'm gonna try to stay on my diet. And uh, but yeah, you can't bring certain things in the house, whether it's food or 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 media, certain types of media if it's, it's tempting to you, um, you know, or certain conversations or whatever the case may be. But yeah, that food is a big one. That food is a big one. Okay, I'm gonna just throw cheesecake away. No, <laughs> you can have cheesecake, Jamaica. You can. You can it's moderation. moderation. No, I, I don't. I don't need any more sugar for the rest of the week. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, there, there you go. If you, you know, moderation, right? You know, my my moderation, Camille. I'm a popcorn junkie. I mean, I can eat popcorn, man. And if you go get that popcorn from uh. What's that? Garrett's popcorn up there in Chicago. Chicago. I was in line in the heat in Chicago to get Garrett's popcorn. So I'm a popcorn junkie. So Camille has figured out if she buys these little bags, these little hundred calorie bags of popcorn, she thought that that would be a way to make me do it in moderation. Only problem, I just would eat ten bags. <laughs> so, but but the key is, even, you know, you can have stuff if you do it in moderation. You can watch TV. If you do it in moderation, you can eat certain food in moderation. You can, you know, enjoy certain things that are in this world in moderation. It's when we get overboard with it, I think, that um, and get outside of our restrictions that 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 we find ourselves in trouble. Well, I didn't mean to mess up your cheesecake, Mr. Mika. <laughs> I messed up my cheesecake with the cookies and oh, well, yeah. and all that other stuff I already had. So. <laughs> There's a lot of information in today's lesson. A um, lot that I need to work on and apply personally. But if you have two minutes to try and get this message across to somebody that might be new in the faith, they might be 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, how do you deliver all of this quickly and concise, concisely and try and get through? So, so, so Andrew, do you have the outline? Do you have the outline? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. What? That's a great question. A great question. Here's what I would do if I had five minutes. I would go through the um, the part where it says snake eyes and okay those questions. Uh huh. You know which one I'm talking about? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I would ask the person. Hey, which which one describes you? Do you feel like you're immune to temptation? Do you feel like you're overwhelmed? Do you not believe that the devil exists? Because then what that will do is it will give you some idea of where are they. Right? Okay. And let's say, let's just say, for example, they say, Oh, I don't believe in that devil stuff. You know, I think that's just a bunch of talk. Then I would talk to them about 1 Peter 5 and 8, how, how the devil is described as a roaring lion, and then make it very real to them about situations maybe in your own life, or you might want to use a biblical character, about how you've seen the devil operate like a lion stalking its prey. And a young person, if I'm talking to a young person, I would be like, and I know you don't think you're in trouble or you think you can outrun everything and you think you, but that's what the zebra thought. <laughs> and the next thing you know, he's lunch for the lion. And I think then I would talk about 
the last part would be asking them, have they ever felt like they wanted to do something right but found themselves doing something wrong? And why is that? And then show them, here's how you can avoid that the next time. That's okay. the way I would do it if I had two to five minutes. Okay. Find out where their mindset is, make it real to them in their own life by showing them some examples or letting them bring up some examples and then giving them the remedy, the remedy for how to deal with it going forward. Okay. That's, that's All right. Thank that's you. That's the way I would do that. That's a great question. That's a great question. I probably should have did that, huh? Rather than giving y'all all that information. But I, I got 15 <laughs> different people on here. So I, I would have had to go in 15 different directions. But it's a great question. Who else? The other thing I'll say to Sister Dandridge's point is if you have the outline, really the way this is designed to be taught, it was, it was really not designed to be taught in an hour or 45 minute Bible study. It was designed to be really taught in more like a two hour session where we could have some discussion and dialogue. Um, and so really what I would encourage you to do is go back over it and spend some time reading the scriptures that I mentioned, taking some notes, answering some of the questions. What I really kind of wanted to do is just kind of whet your appetite or give you an overview of it so that you could go back through it yourself or with somebody else or with a group to kind of dig, dig into it a little bit deeper. But um given the time constraint, I wanted to get the information to you during this month of October. Who else? Anybody else? I know we're right up against the time. Um, thank y'all for being on today. Um, man, I had a great time in the Lord. Again, still basking from Sunday. Um, getting ready to head into November. Um, of course, the election's coming up. If you haven't already voted, please, please, by all means, try to get out an early vote. I know the lines are long. I know um, different voting places may take a little bit of time, but, but get out and vote. Try to get out before election day. But if you do need to wait until election day, have a plan um, to do that. Really important to vote. Would never tell you guys who to vote for. Um, you are smart people, but um, make sure you have a voice in what's going on uh, in the world in which we live in and the way we share our voice in this country. Yes, by protest. Yes, by civil um, uh, disobedience in some cases. And yes, by policies and procedures. But one of the best and most important ways is through us voting um, and exercising our right to vote candidates in and sometimes vote candidates out. So make sure you're doing that and encouraging other people to do that. Also, um, be prayerful uh, as we go down the home stretch. Uh, we're going to be doing some things coming up in December and planning for January at the church and, of course, November as well. Uh, so just keep keep the church, keep the staff, keep the, the whole church family uh, in your prayers as we try to hear God's voice about what the next steps are and how we move and what we do. All right. And um, I love you guys very much. Thank you all for so many text messages and emails and different things encouraging me. I really do, do appreciate that so much. Camille's birthday is today. Um, she, uh, so I surprised her and went and got the two oldest kids. So uh, all of the kids are home uh, for her birthday tonight. So we're gonna have a celebration with her. Uh, so that's a real big deal for our family. So thank you guys for those who wished her a happy birthday and pray for us and pray for her as well. So. Let me pray for you and uh, believe God's best for you. I love y'all. Love God. We love you. We love each other. We try to do our best to avoid temptation as you keep us from evil. God, I pray for us that we have, after we have fallen into the sin, we will confess our sins, knowing you are faithful and just to forgive us and purify us of all unrighteousness. God, I pray for this uh, Bible study that will hide the word in our heart that we might not sin against you as we lead the Zoom call today. God, keep us from evil. Keep us from cause and pain. Let your hand of protection be with us. Expand our territory and bless us indeed. We believe these things are already done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Love y'all. I'll see y'all next time. God bless.
Bye-bye.